Welcome back to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. I'm so excited to have the amazing Justine Martin. Or we'll call you Juz. Yeah. Can we call you Juz for the interview? You can. <laughs> now, just looking at the bio for Justine, it is phenomenal. So Justine Martin's successful corporate life was turned upside down in 2011. And she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Since then, she has battled three cancers and overcome a long list of serious medical conditions. Rather than allowing her hardship to overcome her, she has used it as a platform to inspire and make a difference in the lives of others. Justine is a public speaker, resilience coach, and an advocate for medical care. She uses her own experiences of living with a disability to encourage others to take steps towards a positive future of their own by finding hope, overcoming adversity and building resilience. I love that. She speaks from the heart, connecting with many audiences through her varied background in corporate sales, art, volunteer work and experiencing illness. She pursues any opportunity to inspire and empower members of the public, business owners, corporate teams, schools, and charitable and educational organisations. She's made many media appearances in television, radio, and print media over the years and ran, which I can't remember knowing this, for Parliament in 2010 to 2013. So twice. Did twice. You know? Twice run for parliament, uh, a multi-award winning artist and her art is amazing, I've seen it myself. Justine runs wellness and art therapy classes in her studio in Marshall in Geelong and that's in Victoria, Australia for those that are listening overseas. Her own artwork is available to purchase at Just Art and that's J-U-Z-T Art Gallery located at Cafe Zoo in Drysdale and that's in Victoria, Australia. To reach as many people as possible with her powerful message of hope, Justine has developed an online course for people struggling to overcome life's adversities. And it's called Resilience Mindset, How You Gain Resilience and Hope in Eight Weeks. That is fabulous. So welcome, Justine, Juz. Thank you, JJ. How are you? That was a big, that was a big bio to read out. It is a big bio, but I did condense it down for you. So you'll be, you've lived a big life, that's why. I have, I have, yeah. <laughs> and life's not over yet, so the first uh, first half is now into the second half. Yeah, absolutely. So just tell the, the listeners, tell us, let me go back and tell us a little bit about your story because okay. there's so much that's happened in your life. And I know I mentioned before we we started to record, We, I, I said, maybe it's, let's start with, with 2011 when you were diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And you said, no, I want to talk when I was nine years old. So, mm. so tell us about your story. Okay. I was just sitting there thinking, I thought, well, it actually starts earlier than that. Um, my mum in 1974 was diagnosed with breast cancer and I was about three and a half and my brother and I uh, had to go and live with my grandparents for what I can remember about six months um, before she was able uh, to look after us. And then when I was about nine, 10, um, mum was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So I had her as a role model um, in resilience as well, right back there, seeing her bounce back from all of her illnesses. Then in, I would have, mm, she was 40. I can't remember how old I was because I, I can't count anymore. That's a bit of the uh, whole MS thing. Um, when she was 40, uh, she was diagnosed with cervical cancer and then um, she was diagnosed at 49 with uh, lung cancer and passed away um, at uh, 49 from complications from MS. Right. So then I had two children and... Um, uh, so I've got Zach and Ali and they're now, oh, Zach's nearly 28 and Ali's just turned 24 and I'm a grandma uh, to nearly six. Uh, wow. we've, got one, we've got one due in um, about seven, eight weeks time. So it's all exciting. Um, so then in 19, 
Oh, no, hang on. Let's think. 2011 yeah. um, or 2010, I became very ill. And so I was in corporate life before that and um, things weren't very good. I just recently got engaged and so I was on top of the world. Life was great. I was running for the federal election uh, for the Senate in, in Western Australia. I'm passionate about um, standing up for for our rights I'm passionate about don't just sit there and whinge about something um get in and try and fix it and, and do it and that's what I've taught my kids to do as well so life was good um then all of a sudden my vision went funny and I'm like oh this is not good I've had this happen before I thought it was mascara that I was wearing back in 2002 when it happened but I wasn't wearing any eye makeup when it happened again so after a long series of tests, um, they diagnosed me in March 2011 with multiple sclerosis. Um, my world crashed in a very short period of time. I could no longer work anymore. Um, my neurologist said to me, you're going to have to find a hobby. You're going to have a lot of time on your hands. So I'd always been career focused and uh, trying to be that role model and contribute back to a society, uh, you know, for my children. And then all of a sudden someone's saying, no, you can't go back and work. Um, this is going to be you for the rest of your life. And I'd seen what the damage of MS did to my mum and it was a very, very bleak uh, time in my life. So I hopped online and tried to find some support groups to join and there weren't any. There was none on Facebook, um, there was none anywhere and I felt very alone and very isolated. So I started, I thought, well, why don't I start one? I knew a few other people that had MS and I was going to a few MS groups in Western Australia and I thought, oh, well, I'll start one. Yeah. And um, I did. And that was supporting each other with MS in Australia. And then from there, that group grew and it now sits at about 700 people. But that was a real lifeline to the outside world. When, when you're sitting at home with four walls and you have a partner that doesn't understand and was doing a whole ostrich in the, in the sand thing that I wasn't even allowed to talk about having um, just been diagnosed, it was extremely difficult. Um, we then moved over to Victoria from Western Australia to be closer to my family and for support because my partner at the time uh, was a FIFO worker. So worked in the mines and flew in, flew out and he wasn't going to be at home. Zach had just gone off to the army and I had a 14 year old at home and she'd have to go into foster care because uh, there was no one that could take her if friends couldn't. Uh, so we made the big decision to move across the country and I've done that a couple of times and start all over again. And it was extremely difficult because I wasn't in the workforce when I came over here to make friends and to make connections. Um, but I joined an art group. I thought I've always wanted to learn how to paint and I went off to a community centre and also to the MS art um, classes that they were running and I learned how to paint and within... Oh, about five, six months after um, starting to paint, I sold my first painting for $300. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, I can make some money out of this. I can contribute back to society. Uh, and that felt really, really good to have some independence because my partner at the time earned so much money. I didn't qualify for any government handouts whatsoever. And I was solely reliant on another person. And that's really, really difficult when you've been so independent for so long. Uh, so, yeah, I started to paint and loved it and then started entering competitions and started winning them. thought, oh, it comes fairly naturally to me to paint and draw and here's all these people forking out their hard-earned money to buy my artwork and, you know, I'm being recognised with awards and everything. So that was really good. And then... Um, 2000, so that was 2012. Yeah. Um, and then about November 2012, um, I caught my partner or fiance having an affair, and he turned around and said to me that me having MS would affect his goals and dreams in life. See you later. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I hit 
rock bottom and it's like how am I going to support my daughter who was 15 at that stage what were we going to do you know he left us in Victoria and my world crashed around me again Um, and then it was like well get off the pity party Justine you know you're still breathing you're still above the surface of the earth and you know try and make something of yourself I've always had a passion in helping people and I wanted to do that again. I just wasn't sure on on how I was going to do that. Uh, Then, um, so one of my previous jobs, JJ, was I was a Weight Watchers leader and I was a program director for Jenny Craig. So I'd lost 45 kilos in my weight loss journey. I I call that my previous life. Uh, So it was like anything um, pre-2011 was my previous life. And then come 2011, it was like I was reborn again, even though I became disabled. Does does that kind of make sense? Because some people just look at me and go, you've got to be kidding me. But, you know. It's It's a new chapter. Well, it wasn't just a new chapter. I think it was a whole new book. Um, (laughs) I know it's a whole new book. In the last, like, 10 years, so much has happened in that that 10 years. But my mindset also changed, really, really changed. And How did did that change? I appreciate absolutely everything, even the small things, um, especially the small things and the small things that don't cost money. It's not all money orientated. It's, you know, a hug from the grandkids. It's a smile on your kids' faces. It's um, being able to go out for a walk, breathing fresh air, um, you know, eating good food. All of those things that started, you know, to really appreciate. Um, So then in 2013, I developed um, a heart problem and had to have uh, my first pulmonary vein ablation, so an operation on the internal part of my heart and they cauterize it, so they burn it. And But I was asleep for that one, so that wasn't too bad. And I was told that um, if it was successful, it wouldn't come back um, under 12 weeks. So I've been competing in weightlifting on and off throughout the years. I've also done competitive tug of war, competed nationally in tug of war back in the early 2000s and then swapped over to all round weightlifting, competed in world championships in that. And then uh, when I got MS, took a break of about 12, 18 months and then competed in the Australian Masters Games in bench press and won my uh, weight division and age division. Um, So like being fairly fairly active. And here I was training with this heart problem and didn't realise that I actually had... (laughs) I thought it was internal butterflies from the MS. Right, yeah. Right. Um, not everything that happens to your body when you've got MS is MS. Yeah. You forget that other things can go wrong. Well, you've never had MS, but, you know, you've never experienced MS before, so how do you know what's normal? Yeah, uh, well, you know, I had a good reference with my mum as well yeah. and saw what that had gone to, and I was my mum's carer uh, yeah. for a very, very long time. Um, but yeah, I just put it down to MS. It's like, oh, well, it's just the nerves in my chest. Well, no, actually it was my heart. And I've been doing that for about 18 months. And, um, so anyway, after the first one, they said, if it doesn't come back in uh, 12 weeks, you, you know, you'll be really good. And my first question was when I had the heart surgery was, oh, when can I go back to training? And my um, cardiologist was like, oh, you know, better give it a week or two. And I'm like, okay. And because you don't have any internal scars, like external scars, I'm like, oh, yeah, a week, I'll be fine. I'll go back. And I did. And then 11 weeks later, I was in the middle of a um, Olympic weightlifting comp. So I'd swapped over to Olympic weightlifting by that stage. And uh, it came back with vengeance. Wow. And it hit. My, my resting heart rate hit 217 beats a minute. Wow. So the average, you should be about 60 yeah. beats a minute. And so, yeah, a lovely flashing light trip into a hospital and a second pulmonary vein ablation on that. And then things were going all right. And then I thought, oh, hang on, I think there's still something wrong. And yeah. I was missing heartbeats. Went off to the cardiologist and cut a long story short there. Yep. The average person misses about 25 beats every 24 hours. 
no biggie. I was missing one in every five. Wow. So I then had to have another heart surgery, but I was awake for that one. And that was an experience to have someone inside your heart and burning your heart when you're awake and you're lying there talking to them. They did tell me that they'd knock me out a bit, but that didn't happen. So, um, uh, yeah, I was awake. And then from that, I got what's called um, pericarditis, uh, so which is inflammation of a heart lining. Right. I thought I was having a heart attack. And they it must have been pretty serious because they called in all the family <laughs> to say goodbye. Um, I was not very very good at all um, from that and look that took me probably a good three months to recover and again it was like when can I go back to training so lifting heavy weights and and being on the platform and and associating with such um, positive people um, was really helpful uh, for me and, you know, you walk into the gym or you walk in, I was training at Geelong Weightlifting Club at the time and everyone was positive. No one was ever negative in there. And you are the sum of the five people that you hang around. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And if you're hanging around with negative people, find a new circle of friends, you know, make them acquaintances and find some friends that are positive because that makes a huge difference in your life yeah. and in the quality of your life. So that was 2000. So we went 2013, 14 and 15 for the heart surgeries. And then I'm like, okay, I can't do any more. This is it. You know, let me just live my life. Yeah. Well, no, someone had other plans for me. So then in 2016, um, I started turning purple. So I was competing in Tasmania at the time yeah. in the Australian Masters um, Olympic uh, Championships. Yeah. and Oceanas and Pacific Rim as a master's lifter, an old lifter. Yeah. Anyone over the age of 35 is an old lifter. In, don't uh, say that. <laughs> in Olympic weightlifting, I know, right? <laughs> so this is, uh, yeah, 2016 and in Tassie and I started going purple. My hands all, my left hand went all purple and I was like, oh, that can't be good and um, went off to my GP and she said, oh, it's nothing to worry about. She said, if it's still happening in three months, come back and see me. And I thought, Mm, I'm not liking the sound of that. I have since 2012 regularly seen a counsellor and I contribute my mental state uh, to, to that. Um, I don't have a partner um, and it's not my children's responsibility to hear everything that's mentally going on up here. So I pay a professional to offload uh, to you know and it's not something that you put all over Facebook and and out in social media and, and stuff like that so um, she said to me are you happy with what they've said and I'm like no she goes well you know I really think you need to go see someone else I said yeah I think I think you're right and off I went yeah. and um, through a series of he then booked me in there was lots of blood work and that and he then booked me into a rheumatologist a dermatologist and then the hematologist. So I went off to the rheumatologist. So there's three things that can cause uh, Levidio and that is rheumatoid arthritis, lupus and uh, lymphoma. So the rheumatologist then turned around and said, well, it's not lupus and it's not rheumatoid arthritis. You better go to a dermatologist to confirm that it's Levidio. And I walked out of there going, oh my God, I've got cancer. And it was two weeks before I got to see the dermatologist. So I went in and um, you have to strip down if you've ever been to a dermatologist. And she took one look. By the time I got to see her, the Levideo was in both my feet. Um, it so was, the so Levideo is going blue. Yeah, dark blue, purple colour. Yeah. So the blood actually clots under the surface of the skin. Right. Yeah. And you can look like a road map. Some people look like a road map, yeah. um, just depending on the severity of it. So my ears were going purple, my chin, my neck, my feet, my hands, my arms. Um, and when it first started, it was happening at 12 degrees and then it started happening at um, anything below 19 degrees. We live in Victoria. Yeah. 
It was all through winter. It was terrible. I'd try and take the dog for a walk and I'd go along the waterfront down in Geelong and I'd look like a zombie. And my kids thought it was awesome that mum was from The Walking Dead and I looked like a zombie. But people would stare at me with these really dark ears and I was... You know what I was thinking of? I was thinking of, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, yeah, and the purple, the yeah. Yeah, I know, that was me. And I was a bit chubby, so, you know, I was I was pretty well there. Um, so anyway, I went to the dermatologist and she she goes, oh, when was the last um, time you had a skin check done? And I went, oh, you know, it's been quite some time. And she looked at my feet and she goes, look, it's definitely Lavidia. I don't need to do a um, biopsy. And I'm like, oh, I won't tell you, I won't swear on here. But you can imagine what I said. And I'm thinking, I've got cancer. Oh, my God, I've got cancer. This can't be happening. I've got that C word that none yeah. of us want to hear. Yeah. Anyway, she had me laying down on the bed and she goes, look, there's two spots on your face that I'm not happy with. They're going to have to come off. And there's a mole on your leg. I think we'll do a biopsy on it. We'll take some photos. Yep, no, no, no. And she goes, all right, we'll do a biopsy. And I'm like, all right, well, I'll book in. Um, she goes, no, no, we'll do it now. I'm like, what? Sit up. Next thing, she's got nitrogen on my face and burning two off there. And I'm like, oh, my God, how is this happening? Yeah. And then she cut one out of my leg. She said, nothing to worry about. She's, and I've had other moles cut out, you know, over the years. And um, she said, if you don't hear from me in 10 days, you'll be good to go. I'm like, all right, no worries. Not even 24 hours later, I got a phone call saying, um, you've got melanoma. And I'm like, no, I don't. I'm supposed to have lymphoma. Here I am arguing which cancer it is. And she's like, oh, no, it was the nurse that rang me. It wasn't even the doctor. And she goes, no, 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 sorry, you've got melanoma. And I was in the middle of a shopping centre, like trying to hold it together and not cry. I just went numb. I'm like, how is this happening? So I rang my doctors and I got straight back into my new GP and went, well, Mark, is this why I'm going purple? Yeah. You said it'd be lymphoma. And he goes, no, Justine, this is a separate issue altogether. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You can have two different cancers at once. And um, he goes, you're going to have to go off to, still to the um, haematologist. So I had to go back and have a big chunk of my leg cut out for the melanoma. Um and then I went off to the haematologist and she did lots of blood work and she said, you're going to have to have a bone marrow biopsy. And that happened two days before I was to go to Bali, didn't get my Bali trip in, insurance didn't, wouldn't cover it and they reckon it was pre-existing, which I don't know how they thought it was pre-existing when my doctors hadn't diagnosed, diagnosed me yet, but they seemed to know that it was. Um, anyway, I then started... I, I lost lung capacity. Um, I had lumps sticking all out of fingers and couldn't bend my toes and I was so tired and they couldn't work out whether that was the MS or, or yeah. what was happening with it. And then I got diagnosed with another condition. So not a cancer, but an autoimmune condition. Oh, well, it's in the middle of it all, um, called mixed cryoglobulinemia. And that's what was turning me purple. Um, so that's what was causing the Lividio. So what was causing the cryoglobulinemia? They still hadn't quite worked that out. Um, they knew, but they had to do more tests. So I had like PET scans and CAT scans, and I know the ins and outs of a hospital back to front. Uh, then I got diagnosed in January 2017 with um, chronic lymphocystic leukemia and small lymphocystic lymphoma. So I had the melanoma, the leukemia, the lymphoma, and the mixed cryoglobulinemia all at the same time, wow. as well as having the MS. Yeah. So treatment was was very was very difficult because um, I had to come off MS drugs before I could start chemo. Otherwise, they the two together would have killed me. Yeah. Um, and then I started the path of okay, um, I'm gonna have to fight this cancer. And not really once through that having all the cancers was I terrified that I was going to die. Um, 
it was like, okay, I can just do this. You know, my mum survived them. Why can't I survive them kind of thing? And I went on the path of of, um, fighting to stay alive uh, and doing everything they told me uh, to do. Um, And I'm in full remission um, from all of those. How long have you been in remission for? Uh, Since... uh, late 2017 early 2018 um, from those yeah then I was diagnosed with um and I say it with a smile I know you do it with a giggle it's like (laughs) another thing another thing who needs to go to university JJ to get letters after their name I've got like MS CLL, SLL, you know, the list just goes on of all the you letters. You sound like a doctor when you just roll off the tongue of what you've got. I'm like, I've never heard of that before. And because I can roll it off the tongue, quite often a lot of people are like, oh, you could be a doctor. I was like, well, actually, I go in now and tell the doctors I want this treatment and this, this and this. So, um, yeah. Uh, but then I was diagnosed with a thing called um, lipedema. Now, lipedema is a genetic condition. Yeah. And it affects 11% of all women. And the majority who have it do not realize what it is. Yeah. What, so what it think? is, it's inflammation of the fat cells in the lower, it tends to be in the lower part of your body, yeah. um, tree trunk legs. You know, yeah. women that have no ankles, cankles, yeah. like. Yeah. So it's very similar to lymphedema. Um, but that affects your feet and a different part. So that's more retaining of fluid. Yeah. Um, lipedema is actually inflammation um, of the fat cell. Yeah. And it's resistance to weight loss. It's, it's also known as painful fat syndrome. So this is probably resonating with a lot of women that are listening to this yeah. today. You bruise easily. Um doesn't matter how hard you try and lose weight it's very slow coming off um you can have it in your arms so i have it in my arms and i have it in my butt and i have it in my legs right so specific areas you can have it in yeah interesting and you'll always be around about two sizes smaller through the waist to what you are in the hips right um, is is normally the case. So yeah. I don't have the lymphedema. I have the lipedema or lipedema, yeah. depending on from what country you're in, um, yeah. as to pronounce it. Um, the World Health Organization have finally recognised it and given it a number. Yeah. And there are more doctors now in Australia that are recognising um, what it is. And you know, we're always um, on the bandwagon trying to. Um, uh, you know educate people on on what it actually is so um, yeah. you can have liposuction and everything to try and um, help with it but because of my immune system I can't go down that path um, so yeah that was 2018 um, I realized through an Instagram post when this yeah. woman put up I went oh she's got legs like me and she yeah. was talking about it and I'm like Oh my God, she was in America. She was actually in a swimsuit as well. I'm like, oh, that's really brave. Um, and off um, I went to the doctors and he goes, oh, there's no such thing. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I think there is. And he goes, oh, you better go off and have this mass lymph drainage massage anyway. Yeah, there is. So um, and that was 2018. So I then decided that I wanted to help people again. Um, since I was in remission and my MS has been quite stable, except for the end of 2017, I woke up one morning, couldn't walk anymore. That was a little bit of a um, challenge and and spent weeks in hospital learning how to walk. Um, I tend to overdo it. Surprise, surprise. And my body likes to remind me that, no, I'm not Wonder Woman and uh, that I need to slow down a bit. And, yeah, you know, I finished chemo and decided to drive to Newcastle and then flew to Perth. So who would think that um, my body wouldn't like that? Yeah. Uh, so I, that was a big wake-up call, actually, and learning how to, to walk again and, you know, so much pain and, uh, and that. But I then went back to the gym Um early 2018 and I couldn't even bench press any more than three kilos 
and that gave me the shits big time yeah. <laughs> um and at the end of last year i did um 30 kilos uh, so I've, I've built back up again. Um, I'll never be as strong as what I was pre-MS, but as long as I'm competing against myself and I'm still, you know, either maintaining or going up, um, then it's a good it's a good thing. And everyone should um, do some weight-bearing exercise. My biggest fear, JJ, is having a fall and being stuck on the ground and I don't have enough muscle mass to actually get myself off the ground. Yeah. Um, and having to spend all night there until someone could come in, you know, get me off the ground. And that's what kills a lot of old people is that yeah. they don't have enough um, muscle mass. So I'm back weightlifting um, three days a week. Um, at the moment, I'm doing lower body because I've got a broken arm. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, last year I broke a toe and a rib. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it's just a, another obstacle. Um, so I decided back in, I became an MS ambassador about six, seven years ago to go and educate people on what hidden disabilities actually are because I don't look disabled unless sometimes I use a walking stick, sometimes I'm in my wheelchair and I do have a mobility scooter. But if I, when I'm good, I'm, I'm good and I, I won't use those um, mobility aids, but they are there for the times that I do actually need them. Yeah. And um, where was I going then? Oh, God. See, it's an <laughs> MS thing. Totally gone. <laughs> Happening in, in your world. <laughs> oh, it'll be in there somewhere. Oh, my God. So one of my problems is cognitive. I have cognitive things, cognitive cognitive issues. Um, oh, so that's right, MS ambassador, and out uh, talking, you know, about uh, what disabilities are and hidden disabilities. And then I was working for the MS readathon again, going into schools and and telling kids all about MS, which I did when I was seventeen, and so I came a full circle, uh, yeah. you know. And it's so and it's so helpful. I think you know you're talking about when you were you said a couple of things you said when you created this group when you discovered mm -hmm. that you had ms to reach out and and because yeah. i think sometimes that you feel in situations in life whether it's a sickness or or something happens in your life uh that sometimes you can feel alone yeah and so surrounding yourself with people that have experienced that can really you know is, is really important and you just sharing your stories because i'm sure there's people just like you watch somebody on i think you said facebook you know with or instagram i can't remember what you said with a photo of this lady in a swimsuit and you go that's yeah. me yeah so, you that's know, right. discussing all these these challenges that you've had some people will go that's me or it might even be you know maybe i'll get a mole check or you know really does does make us think and, and, and it's all awareness. Uh, yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, I'm quite, as you know, I'm quite vocal with my story. So it helps other people. And, yeah. you know, every time I go to the dermatologist, I'll do a live stream because chances are I've had something burnt off or cut out. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people that follow me and that will inbox me and saying, thank you. I went and got checked and, you know, I had... I had this or I had that. And um, so it is, you know, raising awareness. So then in 2018, um, I decided that I've got a beautiful home and I've got a studio that I wanted to go and teach. And I wanted to help other disabled people um, with art wellness classes. So I started my own business in running, um, yeah, art wellness classes. And I'm at full capacity. I can't take any more in... Uh, which is fantastic and they all love coming every week and, and creating their own you know unique pieces so that's been really good and then um, everyone kept saying to me oh you, you need to write a book you need to write a book of your story and I'm like okay so I started and I'm two years down the track and I'm only up to 19.99 so uh, <laughs> I, I'm 28 years into it so yes I'm 50 um 28 years into it and yeah it's been difficult I won't say that it's been easy actually writing it it, it hasn't it's some of it's been bloody hard to put down on paper will it yeah. all make it into the final cut I don't know we'll have to wait and see 
Um, but then from that and doing some empowerment speaker courses uh, <laughs> with yourself, Jojo, um, I then went, you know, I want to help a lot more people than just those that come into my studio. Um, so, yes, I've become an, um, a resilience coach and resilience yeah. speaker and have designed an eight week um, signature course on helping people gain resilience. Cause everyone says to me, you know, how do you bounce back so quickly? And uh, you know, how do you overcome the adversities in your life? And I actually have to sit and put some thought into it because yeah. it has become natural for me uh, just to do that. And yeah. so, yeah, it's all in the course. Uh, yeah. through that and then my last project that I'm working on at the moment is that I've just completed my fourth draft on a children's book oh wow with yeah. all your art in it with my art in it once I can work out how I'm going to paint or draw so uh with my arm the way it is that's the only thing holding it up at the moment but um yeah so my grandkids feature in it and my puppy oh, dog she gorgeous. features in it and, and that'll be those listening, I'm just going to say that your art, like I love, like you, the giraffe. Yeah, he's in it. He's in and it. The frog. Yeah, she's in it. <laughs> so gorgeous. And you, and are you still doing those decals that you do? Yes. So yeah. that's another aspect of of the business, and hopefully that'll all be launched by the end of uh, this year. So life is busy. So the the decals are um, my artwork. Uh, in large form that you can put on caravans, camper vans and mobility scooters. Actually, they'll stick anywhere. I'm about to have them put on my windows at the front of my house yeah. um, with the one-way vision because yeah. my bed's like a fishbowl. Um, anyone that walks past can actually see it. So I've just had the whole front of the house painted and, and now my artwork's going to go on the front of that. So you won't, you know, you, know, you won't miss my house. I've got a, got a <laughs> five foot ten giraffe in the front yard. Everyone stops. I love it. Absolutely That's love it. I love a giraffe, listeners. Not a real one. <laughs> no, no, no. One that I made. One that I made out of a cement, uh, all, all coloured, um, so, you know, people stop with their kids and they, you know, smile. And I love it how people, when they look at my artwork, they just smile. So, you know, in the early stages when I first started painting, um, that was giving back to society. If someone could stand there and look at my art and smile, um, I felt that I was still worthy um, yeah. as a person. And then, you know, I donate a lot of work to charities, um, and especially, again, in the early days when I couldn't afford to actually physically financially pay money, um, you know, I do a painting and it would sell, you know, $500, $1,000 that they'd raise for it. And that was a pretty proud moment to actually yeah. do that. So, And it's um, amazing how, like, I'm just looking. I'm, I'm going to get off this. I'm going to show you something. I'm just going to do right now. I'm going to get it because I forgot to get it before we started. Up on my... I know what she's going to get for those of you that can't see what she's going to get. Might be something that I did for her a couple of years ago now. I'm just looking, it's got dust on it now. This is my artwork that you gave me. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that just sits in my office. Just. Oh, I can show you a mini giraffe. Because I've got one here. Oh, gorgeous. <laughs> Look at this. Is, these are the prototypes before I make them like five foot ten high. So there you go. So they, one a, this one's like a moose. It's a cross between a moose and a giraffe. So oh, that is so they have the best sure ones, but <laughs> That is so cute. So it guys that are listening on Spotify, you may not be, you won't be able to see this. You'll have to go into my uh my facebook account uh and to see it on zoom but yeah we've got some beautiful art and so what i was going to say is that you may not even realize it but this is sitting in my office and so you know, you've got art that people look at and i mean that's like a legacy yeah. and the beautiful thing is just like your coaching does when you're being a resilience coach you're touching the lives of people that maybe you don't even realize because it's like oh, a ripple effect uh, and the same with your art that that art is sitting in people's offices or wherever it's sitting bringing joy to people and that you know that has to be a beautiful thing 
Oh, yeah, definitely. And and all around the world. I've got artwork all around the world now, and that's just mind-blowing. You know, I have a series of, of gift cards that people buy, and, like, my business is huge. Um, and, I, you know, I pinch myself every day because if I had listened to that neurologist 10 years ago that said, you will never work again, yeah. um, I... I don't know where I'd be yeah. and um, well, I'd be broke. <laughs> I wouldn't have what I have now. I wouldn't have the choices and the freedom and the flexibility that I have now that if I want to go for a way for a weekend, I can, um, which I am doing tonight. As you know, I'm hopping on a plane and going away for three days. Um, so and I think it's, it's so important for others to know that and, and being a resilience coach, it's perfect because you've gone through so many challenges yep. and, and you've always looked for opportunities. You're always looking for opportunities and none of those challenges has, have stopped you from moving forward, even if they stopped you for a short mm -hmm. amount of time when maybe you couldn't get out of bed uh, and maybe you've had oh, to Saying that, that, even in hospital, I would be drawing. Like yeah. all my way through chemo and then when I was, you know, stuck in hospital for those uh, nearly three weeks, I had drawing pads and pencils and pens in front of me yeah. and I would still be um, creating. And at the Andrew Love Cancer Centre, they used to love it, um, when I'd go in for my infusions, my monthly infusions, um, on what um, I would create for them in there. And I can remember one day sitting there and there was this lady... Um, and she had breast cancer and I was drawing a little seahorse and she actually wanted to purchase it. And um, I gave it to her and she goes, no, 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 I want to pay you. And my daughter was actually there with me and she goes, no, mum insists that, that you have this. And, yeah. you know, just the gratitude that she had. And if my artwork could make her life that little bit brighter for that moment of time, it was definitely um, well worth it. So when yeah. COVID hit, I started doing care cards for people. Yeah. Um, so I sent out hundreds of handmade cards all across the world. People yeah. could inbox me and tell me where um, they wanted it sent and the message they wanted it sent in. And I paid yeah. for, drew them and paid for the care cards. So that, that was a nice thing to give back um, as yeah. well. And I'm all about giving back um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, to people, to society. And, you know, if we all gave that little bit, the world would be a nicer place. It's to actually live in. So, um, and I love, I love when you're talking about, you know, your art or where you're talking about the challenges that you've had. One thing that I've seen that you've done really, and you continue to do does is that you adapt. So, yeah. so art wasn't maybe in your focus to begin with. No. So, and, and, and it was a time where you thought, what else can I do? If I can't do my weightlifting at this moment, can I do this? Um, you're always adapting and I think that's a really important part of your process because we can, and, and part of that is your identity as well as who you think you are. You know, you went from corporate, so you would have had this identity as a corporate woman and then now you've had, then you'd have to adjust it to, you mm -hmm. know, an artist, to a weightlifter, to a, you know, and so you've really... Grandma. A grandma, like really opened your mind to changing it's it's I often say this to my clients you know your your identity or the roles that you play don't define you and you can still get you can still get your needs and values met maybe in a different vehicle maybe it maybe it can't be weightlifting in this moment but maybe you can get it from something else and I think you've done that really well so it's funny you say that because you know, the broken arm, um, yeah. you can't exactly fully train. And yeah. I have a PT three days a week. And um, I said, I'm still coming in. And I do, I do three leg workouts a week at the moment. So anyone that whinges about a leg workout, think yeah. of me that's doing three a week on legs because um, I can't wait there on my arm at the moment. So um, I'm just adapting. I modify. I just mo yeah. keep modifying everything. And my wardrobe modifies as well because of it. Because I spent, prior to getting MS and in the corporate world, 
five days a week in black suits. Yeah. And then all of a sudden when you're at home all the time, it's like, oh, now what do I wear? All right, I need to reinvent what my wardrobe's going to be. And I've had to do that quite a few times. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you just, you just adapt. And, yeah. you know, life didn't stop when I became disabled. It just took on a new meaning, totally new meaning. Yeah. Um, and don't get me wrong, I was angry uh, for quite some time. And, you know, I was always told that I wouldn't get MS that um, it's not hereditary, but if there's a genetic predisposition because all the environmental factors are in place, then you can get it. And my family is so blessed that there was four of us and um, four that are biologically related all on my grandma's side. And then there's two in-laws that have it as well. So six of us in total, which is quite unusual to have that many in in such a cluster. But, you know, there's 25,000 of us in Australia alone that have multiple sclerosis. Um, So this May is um, the 50K month. And I've got sponsors and I'm hoping to raise $2,000 um, in May by walking 50 kilometres for the month. So maybe me went, oh, no, I'll do 100K. So I'm going to do 100 kilometres for May. Um, look out on the live streams when I'm out walking at night um, <laughs> and raising, raising much needed research money um, to find a cure. So, um, you know, for, I'm those that, the, for those that want to support you, where do they find that? Um, they can find that on my Facebook social media, Justine Martin Speaker, um, on that. Yeah, yeah. All the links will be there uh, for them. So. Wonderful. And so in regards to you know, people right now going through their own challenges, so whether it's challenges in regards to thickness, illnesses, uh, maybe it's, it's personal, other personal challenges or business challenges, what could be some of the, the tips that you would give those people in regards to, and I know you've got a, a whole week, uh, eight week course on it, but what are some of the resilience strategies that you may, you know, want to give those people? What would you say to them? That there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. That not every day in the future is going to be a bad day. Uh, that to journalise everything, to write it down. Yeah. Um, when it's out on paper, it's not in your head. Yeah. Uh, most definitely. Um, to find a really good support person. So a counsellor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. Um, go to your GP and get a mental health care plan done if you're in Australia. Yeah. Um, so then you're not forking out the money out of your pocket. Um, to reach, yeah, reach out for help. Uh, to do some small goals. And the small goal might be that you're going to get out of bed that day. You're going to get out of bed and you're going to make your bed. And that's one thing that I do every single day, no matter how sick I am, is that I get out of bed. I might only walk to the lounge room and hop on the lounge, but I get out of bed and then I've done something and I make my bed. Yeah. So then when I walk back in that night, it's like I have done something today. I've made my bed. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it's just a mental thing. Um, to do so yeah diarize things journal them and no one has to read it no one has to read it just for yourself so it's out of your head find some support um and get out of bed every day yeah probably shower as well because um i'm sure your family and friends would like that (laughs) Um, but yeah those those simple things um will definitely help with your mindset yeah I love and it. then eat eat really well and yeah. um and drink lots of water and has your focus on health changed since you've you've had these illnesses that since you've been diagnosed have you had a new focus on your health no that's the funny thing like everyone's I've been focused on my health since 1999 um so I was morbidly obese I weighed in at um just under 125 kilos and then I joined Weight Watchers for the third time 
and I lost 46 kilos and, and got down to um, 79. Didn't yeah. stay there for very long and, and plodoed and then lots of medications. I went back up. The heaviest I've weighed um, since was 101.9 and that was after I went through chemo. When you get cancer and you go through chemo, this is going to sound really bad, but I'm like, oh, finally going to be thin. <laughs> That was what went through my brain because it's like, oh, you know, most people you see lose a lot of weight through chemo. No, not all of them. I actually put on 12 kilos um, through all the steroids that they had to give me as well. So they forgot to tell me that bit. Um, But I've got all of that off now and um, and more. So I'm I'm very careful on what I eat. Yeah. Um, I have been for a long time. Um, and I only drink water, but I have a lot of allergies. I don't know if you remember, JJ. I, like, I'm allergic to caffeine. So I haven't had a cup of coffee in 29 years. Imagine me pinging around if I'd had coffee. I, you know, I buzz around enough without any caffeine. <laughs> and, um, you know, no lactose, no dairy. I don't have dairy. I don't have wheat. Um, and I, I mainly just drink water and for a buzz, I drink uh, sparkling water. I still drink a little bit of alcohol on social occasions. You might see some of my live streams on a Saturday night. (laughs) Um, you know, life is good. Uh, so, and then I watch what kind of alcohol consumption I have, um, as well. So, and, and I exercise nearly every day. So, you know, weight training three days a week, um, resistance work, which helps with your muscles and um, out walking. So yeah. that, you know, that's the whole package. And, you know, my skin has benefited from it. And, you know, most people tell me that I, they say, oh, you must have really good genetics. You don't look 50. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I have the worst genetics on on the planet when I start rattling off like all the cancers and the MS and everything else. So, um, but you know, you've got to have a good attitude, a good attitude to life. And I do lots of reading. I read lots of um, uh, biographies and self-development books. And if I'm not reading them, I'm listening them to on audible. um, So I can be painting and, and, hear stuff or in the car as well driving so um yeah beautiful so my last my last question before we get into the rapid firing questions Mm -hmm. is what legacy do you want to leave wow um that's a big question um i want I want to know, I want to leave to my children and my grandchildren that you get out of bed every day, you keep moving forward, um, that adversity will happen in your life without a doubt whatsoever. It's how you handle that adversity and don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah. You know, and not every day is that bad day. Yeah. The bad days are there to make you appreciate the good days. Yeah. Yeah definitely and and you know don't give up don't quit yeah and um hopefully i'll leave them some money yeah. <laughs> i'm having fun spending it at the moment so uh there mightn't be much left by the time i uh, go six feet under so uh, and they, they already know that i want <laughs> They already know. Look, I've planned my uh, what I want done when I die. And, um, you know, lots of people don't like talking about death, but when you've faced it as many times as I have, it's like, you know, plant a tree on me. You know, if everyone had a tree planted on them when they die, we wouldn't have an ozone problem. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, life out of, out of death, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Anyway. All right, I'm ready. Are you ready for your rapid fire question? Oh, I've got to find mine. Hang on. You did tell me to get them ready. Yes, all right. I'm I'm ready. Fire them at me and then I've got yours. Oh, I can't wait for mine. I'm a bit nervous but the ones you I'll laugh ready. if we've got the same questions. <laughs> all right, so your first one is the best piece of advice given to you. Best piece of advice. Mm, I can't say that one on a podcast. Um um go for it. I didn't care. Use protection. Use protection. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what I say to my kids when they were younger. And even my girlfriend last week. I'm like, use protection. <laughs> Your favourite book? Um, 
my favourite book. It would have to be at the moment um, uh, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Oh, I've, I'm, I've listened to that on um, audio. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's great on audio too. Listen That's to what that. I'm doing. I, yeah, I've nearly finished it, but that would have to be. Um, and, the, and the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah. Who would play you in a movie? Ooh, what's the um? What's the woman who plays Wonder Woman at the moment? I don't know. I only know Lin it was Linda Stone. No, it wasn't Linda Stoner. Uh, yeah, Gardner, wasn't it? Gardner, something, yeah, something like that. Um, the the woman that plays um, yeah, or um, oh God, what's her name? Oh, I can't remember. You see, you know, cognitive issues. Sandra Bullock. Sandra Bullock. If you could change your name, what would it be? What was that? If you could change your name, what would, what would it be? I don't think I'd want to change my name. But just say you had to. What would it oh, be? <laughs> if I had to, had to change my name. Um, Violet. Violet. Okay. If you could trade lives with anyone for one day, who would it be? The Queen. If you could win an Olympic medal for any sport, real or fake, what would it be? Olympic weightlifting. <laughs> if you could have five people over for dinner, whether they're currently alive or dead, who would you have? Ooh, I would have Elvis. Yeah. I would have uh, my mum. I would have oh, five people. Dead or alive? Yeah. Um, hmm. Who else would I have? Oh, I don't know, JJ. I'd probably have my nana. Oh, both my nanas. Um, they're both passed. I'd probably have both of those. And how many is that? Is that five? Um, no, that might have been four. Um, I would have oh, Heath Ledger. If you could have one superpower, what would you have? A, a bullshit detector. <laughs> oh, I think I want that one too. <laughs> hidden talent. What's my hidden talent? Yeah. Oh. Um, I can touch my nose with my tongue. Yeah. <laughs> no, I am not doing it on camera. <laughs> oh, you don't believe it. Do it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And who has been the biggest influence in your life? Um, probably my mum was. Yeah. I, I mean, I lost her when I was um, 26, but she was still probably the biggest influence yeah. there. So, yeah. Beautiful. All right. I'm ready. You ready? ready mine. Okay. okay. What's your favourite meal to cook? Gnocchi. Oh, I'm coming for dinner. <laughs> um, if you could paint your car any colour, what would it be? Rose gold. Oh, yes, I just bought suitcases that <laughs> colour. I'll take a photo and show you later. Um, what do you think of garden gnomes? <laughs> I think it's really funny when people pinch other people's and no, no, not, I'm not saying they're just stealing them, but they're friends and they take each other's gnome and they help them for ransom. Or you take them on holidays and you, and you send postcards of where they are. And I, my garden gnome's inside so no one pinches her because <laughs> I painted it to look like me. Um, if you were a fish, what kind would you be and why? I'd be, oh, I'd be a fighting fish. Mm. because I fight for what I want in life. Like that. Yeah. What was the last gift you gave someone? Uh, I'm going to say, because I, I won't go gifts as in giving a gift. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I gave a, a gift of a book, a motivational book to somebody. Nice. Yes. You want to buy mine one day and give it to someone? 
Um, okay. When you can travel overseas, where is going to be the first holiday destination? Uh, next, I want to go to Hawaii. Why? As long as I don't have to have a vaccine, I'll be going. <laughs> um, if you can compare yourself to an animal, what would you be and why? I'd either be an elephant or a dolphin. Because <laughs> uh, I just think that they, they just, they're so spiritual to me. Oh. Yeah. How do you describe yourself in three words? I'm a dog with a bone. So I, 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 I yeah, I get things done. Um, I'm loving. And I am passionate. If you owned a time machine, would you choose to go forward in time or back into the past and why? Oh. Um, if you owned a time machine, would you choose to go forward in time or back into the past and why? I would go back into the past to see my dad again. What did you want to be when you leave when you left school? I wanted to be either an actress, a teacher, uh, or a dancer. They were my ten questions. Oh, that's it! <laughs> awesome! Oh, that was a. <laughs> <laughs> they were great ones I loved it <laughs> oh thank you so much Jazz. that was uh I just loved hearing about your life I knew most of it and I think that it's been really helpful for others to hear about your story and I'm sure a lot of people will reson resonate with it in a different way uh, I'm sure you've you've had a lot of challenges in your life and I think the great thing that people can take away is how resilient you can be. Uh, and I, I suppose you, you don't know how resilient you are until you have to be. That's right. And, you know, I have a lot of people that say to me, oh, I couldn't be like you, you know, I don't know how you do it. I'm like, well, until you are actually in this position, yeah, you won't know. But, with you know, without a doubt, you will rise to it as well. Maybe not as fast as what I do on my comebacks, but you would definitely rise to it. And and there is help out there for people that uh, that do need it. So, yeah. And I love that you, you're taking all of your learnings and all of what, what, you know, you've gone through, your experiences to now help other people through your art, through your resilience coaching, through your, you've got your eight-week course happening and you're speaking. Uh, so that's a really beautiful thing that you're doing. And uh, I know that there's so many people that appreciate what you do and there's so many people that you're helping and you may not even know who they are. Um, but they're out there. And so I really want to say thanks for doing everything that you do. And uh, how will people get in touch with you if they want to follow your work, Jazz? So there's lots of different ways. They can follow me on social media at Justine Martin Speaker, or they can follow me at Juz Dart, J-U-Z-T-A-R-T, -T, Justine Martin Artist on social media. Um, or my websites are justinemartin.com.au or justart.com.au. Beautiful. Thank you so much for uh, talking on today. I love talking to you and uh, thank you for giving all that you do to the community. And for those of you that are listening or watching, make sure you get on and connect with Juz because she's an inspiration to so many people. And I know that she will be an inspiration to everyone that's listening. So make sure that you follow her work and uh, just follow her story because uh, her, your story is continuing to evolve. <laughs> oh yeah, my, my story's not over yet. Um, I just wanna say one thing that um, my story can be someone else's survival guide. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And, and I think, you know, what you've shared today is part of that that they can actually take that and and know that they don't have to be alone that's right and uh you know it's like pressing that restart button every day yep. every day is a new day as you said and i think you know you're so grateful you know when you talk about gratitude you talk about you know what you're grateful for 
and uh, and all the learnings that go with that. So it's a beautiful right. thing to share. So thank you, Jazz. You're thank welcome. You so much. And yeah, make sure everyone that you follow Jazz, follow her work and uh, get on to following her in all those different channels. Thank you so much. No and, worries. Um, and yeah, it's been a pleasure. And I'm sure once you get your book happening, we're going to be doing this interview again. For sure. Uh, which one, the kids one or the other one? Well, either, either. Let me know. I'll hold you to that. Again. <laughs> I'll hold you to that. All right. Thanks, guys. No worries. Bye.